Okay, uh, welcome to our healthcare sector panel. Good, uh, good afternoon. My name is Safa Yunus. I'm a research assistant at Workforce Windsor Essex, and I'm excited to be facilitating this session this afternoon. Uh, a little bit about Workforce Windsor Essex. We are a community and development board whose mission is to lead regional um, employment and community planning for the development of a strong and sustainable workforce. To learn more about what we do and how we can help you, please feel free to visit uh, workforcewindsoressex.com. And while this event is virtual, we would like to respectfully acknowledge the land on which we gather today as the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the, and the Potawatomi people, excuse me. Uh, we are grateful to work, learn, and to live in this area. Now to a few housekeeping items. Uh, Please feel free to use the chat feature located at the bottom of the window to engage with the session attendees and the speakers. Uh, you may submit questions at any time. Um, so please feel free to do that. Should you experience any technical difficulties, please send a message in the chat, uh, chat uh, and we'll get to it as soon as we can. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to quickly explain the purpose of this today's conversation. So the aim of today's uh, conversation is to put a spotlight on the healthcare sector, which is a se sector that is consistently in high demand in the Windsor-Essex region. Uh, it's also to showcase the many different roles that are in this healthcare sector um, uh, in order to better inform students or job seekers about the, the recruitment needs um, in the region when making career choices. Uh, so this demand, uh, the demand on this sector has certainly increased during this pandemic and will continue beyond it as well. So if you'd like to learn more about uh, jobs that are in demand in this region, also visit uh, workforcewindsoressex.com slash job dash demand dash report for a current and interactive report on what is in demand in the region. Uh, now I'd like to welcome our speakers for today. Uh, first, we have with us uh, Damilola Gwanosi who is the managing pharmacist at Loblaws on Dougal. Uh, she's been working at that Loblaws, uh, Loblaws for 18 years. She is a licensed pharmacist, certified diabetes educator, certified smoking cessation clinician, and an authorized injection clinician. Welcome, welcome Demi Lola. Uh, we also have with us, <laughs> we also have with us Inas Abdallah, who is a nurse practitioner at the Victorian Order of Nurses. Uh, she is working at the Immigrant Health Clinic in Windsor. Uh, she started with the clinic to help new immigrants to Windsor find a primary care provider, and she has been a nurse practitioner for six years and sees patients of all ages. Also with us today is Diane Quadros, um, who is a practice facilitator for the team care program with the Windsor Family Health Team. Uh, we also have Claire Vinay Rogers, who is a community education coordinator at Positive Pathways. And finally with us today is Stacey Slobodnik, um, who is a social worker at Hotel Du Grace Healthcare. Is that correct? Awesome. All right, uh, so we're just gonna start this conversation off. Um, let's start off with Claire. Um, the first question I have for all the panelists today is, how did you find yourself in this sector? So we can start with you, Claire, if you'd like to maybe share uh, your screen with us. I know you have something prepared. Yeah, sure. Okay, so let me just go to my slide. All the other slides are my notes for when I'm talking. Sure. <laughs> um, so here I am. Okay, um, and let me just full screen this for everyone. All right, so um, yeah, my name is Claire. Thank you for having me here today. Um, so I work for Positive Pathways Community Services. Um, we're an AIDS service organization. So we work in treating and preventing HIV um, and AIDS in the community. And I work specifically with people who um, use drugs because drugs is one of the pathways through which you can acquire HIV. Um, how did I find myself in this sector? Honestly, uh, my path may be kind of untraditional. I actually started in archaeology, um, but I did manage to find the link because ironically, I studied um, archaeological use of drugs. So there's that link there. Um, and then so I, I um, and then after I graduated from archaeology, I was volunteering for a crisis line specifically geared for women. 
And you realize that a lot of women cope with mental health and trauma by using drugs. So it kind of became an avenue I was interested in. And I decided to go and get my social work degree. And um, I worked for very briefly with the community partnership that works in social housing areas. Um, and you do a mishmash of like frontline and, and like you do counseling, advocacy, uh, community revitalization stuff. Um, and then eventually I worked for Positive Pathways. First, I worked in the education and outreach department with the 2S LGBTQ community. And then I um, switched gears and went in the harm reduction department to work with people who use drugs. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. It definitely is nice to have um, someone share, you know, their untraditional path towards the healthcare sector. So thank you for that. Um, next, we can start with Stacy. Uh, if you'd like to answer that question, how did you find yourself in this role, Stacy? Um, well, similarly to Claire, uh, my intention was to be a psychologist. I wanted to work with kids, and uh, I thought that was the only kind of route to take. Um, when I was in high school, I had no idea what social workers did. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity to kind of enlighten the group. <clears throat> I thought the only thing that social workers did was work in soup kitchens or protest march uh, marches. So um, I was surprised to find out that when I had talked to my, uh, I think it was academic advisor in university, and he was asking, you know, what I was interested in. I told him, I'm looking to do like counseling work with kids, youth families. Um, he called up the social work department and said, you know, I got another one for you and sent me on my way. <clears throat> so um, I did. I, I have a BA in psychology, but I have a bachelor's degree in social work, which is a four year program and a master's degree in social work as well. And um, I have been doing this for 28 years. Um, 23 of those years have just been in children's mental health. And so when I um, was able to get a position in children's mental health, it happened to be under Windsor Regional Hospital. And then there was some shifting in programs. And now Regional Children's Center is a part of Hotel Du Grace Healthcare's profile uh, portfolio. So um, that's where I am right now. Uh, however, I also want to share that being a part of a healthcare organization, I also didn't know that there were so many social work roles within healthcare, uh, various capacities. So when you think about a person's journey to wellness, um, there could be a social worker uh, involved from start to finish or at different points along the journey. So it could be in assessment and intake. It can be part of the treatment. So you could be the clinical social worker that does the therapy. And you could also be a part of discharge planning or ER for crisis um, assessment. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Stacey. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. Okay. Maybe we can go on to uh, Diane. Diane, how, how did you find yourself in this role in this sector? I think you've got all three social workers kind of going at it at, oh. at once. Uh, so I too am a social worker and similar to uh, my peers here, uh, out of high school, all I knew was I was good at science and I wanted to help people. So I actually started university in biological sciences because I thought I was going to go into research and work in a lab. Um, and then, you know, um, that wasn't for me because I'm not quiet. So I moved over to communications. And by the end of my second year of university, I had a communications professor who was like, you should really consider social work. So I just went, okay. And I did. <laughs> and I will say, um, you know, my high school years, I did a lot of volunteering. It was part of uh, the program through the uh, high school I went to, which really served me well when I decided to go into social work. And uh, like um, Stacy has mentioned, within healthcare, we've got social workers spread everywhere. So I worked 19 years frontline mental health services. So I, um, was part of the team when St. Thomas in London started um, releasing individuals back out into the community. So I was a part of that. So I, over the years, worked really closely with psychiatrists, really closely with other services, did housing, did crisis work, um, never a dull moment. And fast forward, here I am 
20 years later in a practice facilitator role. So that just means I do a lot more admin rather than working frontline with individuals. But uh, I still am part of um, ensuring that patients get what they need, um, advocacy, um, that kind of thing. So over the years when I did therapy, I always told people in their, you know, teens and 20s and even 30s, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. So as long as you're still moving, as long as you're still doing something, um, you'll always find your way. And healthcare opens a lot of different avenues and doors. Awesome. That's great advice. Thank you so much for sharing that, Diane. Um, we can move on to Inas. Inas, if you'd like to share with us how, how it is you found yourself in the sector and in the role that you're in currently. So um, I, I, I like to, I think my way was a little bit of a lazy way in honest and honesty. Um, when I was in high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to become. And I, when I was looking through the programs, I go, oh, look, nursing, four years and I'm done. So that's essentially what I picked. Um, when I was in my first year, I wasn't sure if I liked it. Um, if anybody is aware of what you do in nursing, there's a lot of personal care to patients and things like that. So a lot of days you go home with different fluids on you, right? And I think it was after my first year that I realized if you can go into a patient room and that happens and you kind of come out with a little bit of humor, you can get through it. Um, and it was always the patients thanking you after for the work that you did that kind of kept motivating me to keep going. Uh, after the four years were done and I had completed nursing, uh, I, I kind of felt like I wanted to do more. Um, I did some volunteering, I did some research and did my master's. And I, it was one of my mentors that really encouraged me to go and do uh, become a nurse practitioner. <clears throat> so for me, it was a total of eight years at school, but I love what I do every day. I go to work happy, which is essentially what you want to do and what you want to get out of any type of schooling you do. You don't want to sit in the parking lot and go, oh, I don't want to be here. You want to be happy that you're going to work. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. It sounds very, I mean, once you get past the fluids and all that, it sounds rewarding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those were only a tiny part, but like I said, poop right. jokes all the way. Awesome. Yeah. All right, Damilola, how about yourself? How did you find yourself in the role that you're in in the sector? I guess mine's more traditional because, um, well, coming from Nigeria and immigrating to Canada, my mom's actually a pharmacist. So like watching her be a pharmacist as I grew up, that also inspired me. So as a kid, I always wanted to be a pharmacist. So we come to Canada, finish school. I'm like, I already know what I'm doing. I started working like after even high school, I started, I got a job right away in the pharmacy just to get a feel of what things are or what it's, what it means to work in the pharmacy. And I'm still here. So like, I now said, yeah, you want to pick something you're going to be happy in. So you're like, you know, going home, like cringing or like, you know, miserable because it makes a world of difference and how you can also serve your patients. Um, so going back, I guess, to how I started here, it was more the traditional, you know, you want all those courses like chemistry, you know, physics and get good marks. Um, and then at the time when I entered pharmacy, we didn't actually need to write the PCATs. So mine was just more, I think there was like a critical essay and an interview. And then um, you only needed a year of undergrad to get in at University of Toronto, or you could do two years undergrad and you could apply to go to Detroit, like Wayne State for pharmacy school. And I got in at University of Toronto. And then I went, so I did a year at the University of Windsor and then went to Toronto for the four years of pharmacy school. But then in between, I would come back, I would come back, sorry, I would come back to work um, like in the summer, like whenever I was on break, I'll come back to the pharmacy at the Zayers in LaSalle. I would do my studentship every summer, every summer. And it was good because they were, I was able to create a rapport and build like um, trust even with the team that I work with and as well as the customers. So, you know, they knew like, okay, are you almost done now? Or when are you gonna be done? Like they would ask every time I would come back um, and it was great. And then now I'm still here. So after I graduated in 2009, I became a pharmacist and then I started working at the store in Leamington, the superstore pharmacy um, in retail. I was there for eight years. Um, after like being fresh from school, it's a little bit different, even as a pharmacist, I, I had training, so I understood what it 
what it took to work in a pharmacy, but even as a pharmacist, it's a different knowledge. I was working more as a technician or like an assistant. So you're mostly doing the technical parts, you know, like counting the pills, input in the prescription. But as a pharmacist, it's now like all of that in one and then assessing whether the prescription is accurate for what the patient is having. Like, let's say they had an infection or something, but then do they have an allergy to this product? Or let's say they were here for a blood pressure medication, but they got an antibiotic instead. So like assessing if this is actually good for them. So that's what you would be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And then also um, trying to manage your time in terms of all the things that need to get done throughout the day, because that's just one patient you can do, but then we have like, we see maybe 200 or 300 patients in a day and then trying to manage your time in prioritizing what's important and then taking it from there. The best thing, like you said, like, and I said too, humor is important, right? So the people you work with make a, um, a big impact on, on the, on the field as well. So it was a learning curve, but then after some time you pick it up, right? Just like anything mm -hmm. new, it's going to take some time to get used to it and then you'll be good. So then I was there for eight years and then I moved to Windsor actually. Um, one of my bosses, like, I guess they needed like somebody to manage the store. Um, and I was commuting to Leamington. So that's about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour away. So I was like, I mean, you would think because I'm closer to home, it would be easy, like an easy decision, but it was so difficult because I've created like a bond and a rapport with all these patients at this other store. So it was hard to leave and even with my colleagues as well, but then ultimately made the decision to move back home. And then here I am. So then I have my certification in smoke and cessation. There's different things that you can do in pharmacy as well. Like it's not just being in retail, you can also work in a hospital pharmacy, mm -hmm. or you could also go into um, research or manufacturing. Um, there's so many different avenues, or even like veterinary, like for cats and dogs. Some people get prescriptions yeah. for the animals here. Too. There's such thing oh. as veterinary pharmacies. Mm -hmm. So many things, yeah. Awesome. Okay, well, thank so you for it. sharing that with us. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I guess that leads into my next question, which you've sort of already answered on your part, is what does a typical day look like for you? Um, so maybe we can go to Claire, what does a typical day look like for you and your role? That's a really hard one to answer when you're in community work, uh -huh, because you're so uh, responding to kind of the needs as they arise. I'm sure others can, can relate. Um, so depending on the day, um, so people who, just so everyone's on the same page, at our agency, we have a needle syringe program, which is where people can access sterile drug equipment. So our philosophy is you meet people where they're at, you keep them safer while they're using. So we don't get the transmission of HIV or abscesses, blood infections, et cetera. So sometimes my day looks like a lot of frontline stuff. So I go out on foot and do outreach um, in communities where there's a need. Um, sometimes I am at the front desk of the needle syringe program doing transactions. Um, and then a lot of my role, um, I'm kind of called like the department chameleon. So I do frontline stuff. Uh, and this is really great for my personality because I do like change. Um, and then I can go and go to my desk and I'm developing workshops or I am developing community partnerships with various agencies or health centers that are interested in carrying some of our supplies because they have clients who use drugs. Um, some, or I'm doing program development or evaluating the success of a program. Um, and sometimes I'm just helping uh, build up what we call satellite sites, which is mini versions of our needle syringe program out in the county where there's a lot of barriers to accessing our supplies. Um, and with that comes, yeah, community partnership building. So there's a lot of social aspects to my, which is funny because I'm introverted, but introverted at home, I guess. Um, and, you know, you go out in the community, you create these partnerships, and then you're just kind of problem solving things as they arise. So in my role, every day is different, every day is new challenges. If you like that stuff, that dynamic stuff, then that's definitely kind of a field that um, I think you should consider. Awesome. Yeah, definitely sounds very interesting. It's sort of uh, definitely lots of different moving parts that you're dealing with all the time, which is nice for if anyone's watching and interested in, you know, something that isn't just so mono um, monotonous. 
right? So before we go on to our, our next uh, speaker and the next the same question, I just want to remind um, the attendees that you can you are free to use the question and answer uh, function at the bottom of uh, of the screen. Um, and just draw questions for our speakers about really anything relating to what we're discussing here today. Um, okay, so uh, Ines, if you'd like to describe uh, what a typical day looks like for you. So my days are usually the same every day. I work Monday to Friday, nine to five. It is nice to have weekends off. Not everybody in my field gets that um, opportunity. Um, I see patients of all ages from brand new newborn, uh, to, I don't think I have anybody that's a hundred, but you get the point, um, for anything really. And work essentially like a family physician. Um, there are a few things that a nurse practitioner cannot do currently, such as ordering an MRI. And I do have a consulting physician that works with me, um, for those things. But, um, side fact is that's going to be available in July of this year. So I'll be able to order MRIs then. Um, so yeah, I, see newborn babies for their shots, for their newborn checkups. And then I see um, an older population for maybe a knee replacement or any other things. I see uh, people for immunization. Um, I do mental wellness. Um, sometimes it does get to be very repetitive and you seeing the same type of thing every day, but then you get, um, uh, days where I'm flying to Pelee Island to do a COVID vaccine clinic, which is really cool, um, or doing outreach. So we, like, there was a couple of times we do like hypertension outreach and people who have no idea that they have hypertension because a lot of people don't go to see their primary care provider. They're like, oh, hey, you should probably go. Um, yeah, so it's very fun. You get to meet a lot of interesting people and it's fun because you get to make a difference in people's lives. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for that, Inas. Um, Stacey, how about yourself? What does a typical day look like for you? So right now I am in, and I plan to stay in a management position, but when I was frontline, the kinds of things that we would do here, so your shifts could vary. They could be eight to four, 10 to six, 12 to eight. And if you were working in the ER or the walk-in clinic, it could even be later or on a weekend. But uh, let's just say it's a typical day and you have a caseload of about 20 kids and families that you're working with. So you would come in and kind of do some session prep for your um, sessions. And depending on you know, the ages and developmental stages of your folks, uh, you're gonna be very creative in those approaches. So we use lots of props. We have like some feeling cards. You might wanna do like some feelings, um, uh, musical chairs. So you just kind of tuck these around on the different chairs, put on some music, and as they go around, you might have to talk about a time that they were frightened or a time that they were happy. You might want to get out some mindfulness activities. So again, we kind of go to our resources to pull out something really colorful and activity-based. Um, you are encouraged to take lunch and uh, have lunch with your peers, so between 12 and 1, and uh, kind of have that self-care for yourself. And then your afternoon might be a parent session where you're preparing to talk to a parent about how to understand their children's behavior. Um, following that, you might have some phone calls and documentation to do based on those sessions. You're doing some case notes. Uh, you might have to collaborate with you know, another team member, maybe the in-home worker who's focusing more on parenting strategies. And then after that, you might want to get together with your other group facilitator to run a group in the evening. Um, we have like a Coping Cats, which is uh, a children's group for anxiety. And we also have Emotion Detectives, which is just general emotion regulation. And again, all very activity-based uh, things like that. So um, there's a lot of fun, uh, but because it's working with kids, we, you want that time to kind of prepare for your activities. Uh, you might be making slime, uh, you might take them outside and do basketball shots, um, anything fun to kind of get that child to um, be engaged and kind of like participate in the content that you're teaching them. Wonderful. I mean, these are things that you wouldn't really expect when considering healthcare as sort of a career is, you know, making slime and things like that. But that's so interesting and wonderful to hear. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, Diane, uh, how does a typical, what does a typical day look like for you? Uh, so a typical day for me nowadays looks like a lot of uh, healthcare data 
at a management, um, which doesn't sound like fun, but once you've been in the field for as long as I have, it's uh, interesting to see how important the data is to be able to watch programs grow, right? Um, so we talk about need in healthcare, but the only way we're going to get dollars from the government is to show um, what the needs are and to show if your pro program is working or not. So I work with um, a large team of IT professionals to ensure that we're getting uh, appropriate data. And then on another level, I'm every day working with my team here. So when we're talking about diversity in healthcare, um, I'm very lucky because in my team, we have nurse practitioners, we have addictions counselors, social workers, pharmacists, dietitian, kinesiologist, physiotherapist, therapist, foot care, um, and we also have physicians upstairs. So we're constantly meeting as teams, everybody from their own profession to work on these complex cases together. Um, so talk about in terms of if you like to learn uh, different areas, these case consultations are always a learning experience. Um, no two cases are alike, everyone is unique. So you're always learning different things from your uh, professionals on the team. Um, so it's always, it's always nice to know that you're not alone, especially when you're working in healthcare. Um, if you ever start to think that you're working alone, you need to shake your head because you're not. Um, there's always a variety of people out there that um, are able to help. And um, like Claire had mentioned, healthcare is a lot about networking too, right? Ensuring that you know what services are out there. We're all here to help each other out. So that's a typical day for me. Wonderful. Wonderful. And thank you for mentioning all those different roles also um, and how they all interact with each other and in the team that you, uh, you work with. So um, we do have um, another question. Um, uh, it's from the audience. Um, I think Stacy has already responded to it, but maybe if we can get some responses from other, um, other speakers. The question is, what are some difficulties you may face or do face as a healthcare provider? Um, so as much as we are talking about um, and bringing awareness to the different roles within the healthcare sector, it's important also to discuss some of the difficulties that come along with that. So um, if anybody has uh, something to say, you could always just put your hand up or go ahead. Go ahead, Diane. Uh, so some difficulties in healthcare is um, you're always expected to do more with less. So it's understanding that it's understanding you're going into a field that there's always going to be a lot of demand on you. Um, you're always going to be pushed and asked for more. So that's where that self care piece really comes into play. Whatever profession you go into to go into healthcare, they'll teach you those. It's going to, it's really important for you once you get out in the field to ensure that you're keeping up with that. Um, so that, and, you know, sometimes too, it's hard to come home after a day where you've done everything you can and you still weren't able to help the individual out, right? So th those for me are some of the hard parts of the job. Right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think that also maybe touches on what Stacy had um, replied to in the chat that so many families, individuals are in need and not enough resources. So you in that role and in your capacity doing as much as you can, um, can still be, be difficult at the end of the day. Um, Claire, you had your hand up next. Maybe you can also respond. Sure. Um, I think this touches all like domains of healthcare, but when you work directly with people who are actively using drugs during an overdose crisis, um, that's nationwide, it's tough. Um, so you are on the front lines of, um, you know, I mean, it's unfortunately frequent that we know that service users have passed away. Um, so there's grief and there's, um, there's burnout that happens because of that. And so just know going into this field specific and particularly, but I'm sure everywhere, even in mental health, you know, um, you are, there's the possibility that you make these connections with service users and then you don't see them again. So it's hard. Um, 
And just like everyone else said, lack of funding, especially when you work in a not-for-profit, especially in a department that's highly stigmatized, you are having to learn to do a lot with pennies a lot of the time. And so you do become really thrifty and creative. Um, and then lastly, it's um, um, the challenging part on, on my end um, as a community education coordinator is um, when you court, when you're talking with people um, in various jobs or um, levels of the government that have some very stigmatizing point of views about people who use drugs um, and having to really squash down the anger in those interactions um, and learn to use empathy and even humor to deliver these really hard messages to try and get these people on board with you. Right. Oh, so, yeah. Okay. Um, Inas, really go ahead. So, like any job, there's a lot of difficulty, but you have to remember that within the healthcare, just like Claire said, you're connecting with people and you're learning such private things about these people because you are a trusted place. They're coming, the door closes, they can tell you anything. And it is a lot to take on. You have to um, learn, like the like what said, um, the self-care aspect of it. You have to be able to leave um, work and go to your family and be able to smile. It gets tough, especially when you have like mental health emergencies, uh, domestic violence, and you have to get involved to the point where you're calling the police or you're trying to get them emergent care. So it does get tough. Um, but at the end of the day, and you can't win with everybody, you can't help everybody, but even helping one person in that day is meaningful. Right. And it's just a reminder to to do that. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Dami, just really quickly, how is how do you feel about this also? Do you have any comments also? Yes, I think everybody has touched on it. Like the self-care part, that's the hardest thing. And like, you know, people are telling you such private things. They trust you. They see us sometimes more often, you know, than other most like even their family sometimes like when they're far away. So it's just making sure you are able to leave the work at home and do what you need to be able to take care of yourself take care of yourself so you can also show up 100 percent you know let's say so yeah right to re-energize yourself um when dealing with these sort of difficult situations so on the other side of that we've discussed sort of the difficulties that come with um working in this sector we have questions in the chat we have a few of them that are um in regards to you know what is the best thing that you like about your job or can you share a specific time your job was rewarding what was your favorite day on the job and why if anybody would like to go ahead i maybe i can start with um uh dami again Okay. Um, the best thing is the people <laughs> because they come to see you. They're almost so excited. They're like, hey, how are you doing? Like, you know, if I'm gone for one day, they're like, where have you been? You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm here. What do you mean? Um, so it's creating that rapport and also like even the same thing with like your staff, like your colleagues, um, having that networking, it makes the job so much better because then it's like effortless that you enjoy coming to work and what you're doing. So like a best example of the best day would be like, also, pharmacy is a lot of problem solving. So when issues come up, like trying to resolve a situation with a patient, like I, uh, an example is one needed some medications that her plan didn't cover, but then we needed to fax the doctor. There was a, what we call an exceptional access program. So the government will cover it under special circumstances. So then we were able to get in touch with her doctor and have them fill out all the necessary paperwork to get that covered. Otherwise it would have cost like $3,000. So imagine paying that like every month or something like that's like, you can't afford that. But that was something that she was so grateful for us to be able to provide or even get in touch with like social services to be able to get the medications covered that they might not necessarily be able to on their own. And people are so grateful. They bring chocolates, cards, things like that all the time. They're just like, just to say thank you. You know, they're just so grateful for everything that we're doing. So I'm like, that's the best. Like, what more can you do? Because we're passionate about people. That's why we go into healthcare, right? So that's it. Awesome. <laughs> that makes yeah, it definitely. Awesome. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That just definitely sounds very rewarding. And the chocolates and everything, that, that sounds good. <laughs> um, maybe we can switch over to Diane. We haven't heard from you in a little bit. Um, what is the most rewarding part of your job? What's your favorite day, if you want to talk about that? Uh, so most rewarding is um, 
along the same lines, we all go into healthcare because we want to help people, right? So most rewarding is after, you know, say hours or days or even weeks of working on a, um, a complicated case, uh, finally seeing a bit of movement and the person acknowledging that they're noticing uh, improvement. So that's always a win for the entire team. Um, on the flip side of that, I will say in healthcare, uh, every, on Wednesdays, we have our pharmaceutical reps who come in and do presentations and we get lunch. So uh, I'm very food motivated. So <laughs> I thought I'd share that with the high schoolers because that is fun. <laughs> that is definitely fun. Um, food is the best way to get somebody excited for work. So Wednesdays sound great for you work. <laughs> um, Claire, how about yourself? Um, I think a, a good day at work is just, um, I think when you're working with a population that, again, it keeps things highly stigmatized when they come back to you um, and just connecting with them and being curious. And sometimes they bring in their dogs and stuff and you just like get in it. I just love like the social interaction piece um, and seeing them come in first very self like ashamed of themselves and then they leave a bit happier um, I think is really significant and then um, I think some really I think like most recently with our help in um, advocating for a safer consumption site in Windsor and seeing that actually go through the city of Windsor has been a huge piece that has been going on for years and years that we've been trying to assist the health unit in and so Seeing those like big advocacy pieces going through is, is huge though, um, yeah. Wow, yeah, those, uh, that does sound very like monumental and important to you. So that's wonderful to hear. Uh, Stacy, would you mind sharing with us uh, what the best part of your job is? What, uh, what a great day for you at work looks like. Um, well, when you work with kids, there's no shortage of fun moments. So I recall a time when um, I was going to be staying late from my shift and uh, I was still living at home at the time. So this was just when the first couple of years after I graduated and I just needed to let my munchkin know who was in my office that I, I needed to make this call to tell them that, you know, I was going to be another hour late. And she laughed and she said, oh, I thought you were a grown up. <laughs> So funny things like that. I had another kid, you know, we were playing one day and she was like, how old are you? 800? And you just have to laugh that off and then you get to take that home and, and say, oh, someone thought it was 800 today. Um, so there are some fun moments and uh, having the chance to kind of come up with fun ways uh, when you see that the child is really connecting, oh, like I understand negative thoughts now. So now I know what to do. I can talk back to my negative thoughts and um, uh, then, you know, I don't feel so scared. So like seeing them feel uh, and experience that inner power uh, that they have is super rewarding. Helping parents understand that their child is not just attention seeking, that their child is actually like communicating a need. And so this is another way to kind of hear what they're saying. Um, that can be super rewarding. But uh, like everyone has talked about, self-care is so important because there are a lot of down moments too. And it is not fun and games when you are talking with a family who is thinking about like adoption breakdown. So they've had this child for 10 years and it's just not working out anymore. And now we have to figure out what's going to happen next. So those are some very sad, sad times and hard conversations. And then, yep, you have to have that kind of network for who who can I um, debrief with? Because you can't just go home and talk about it with your partner. Um, and you know, when your kids ask you, you know, what 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 happened today at work? There's a lot of things you can't talk about. You can give them some of the funny points, but um, you know, all of that is confidential. So you have to make sure that you've got that team that uh, you can um, yeah debrief with. Right, that's very important. And um, I'd just like to note that all the work that our, all of our speakers here today do is very impactful and meaningful. And I'm hoping that's coming across clear to all of the attendees today. Um, I'm just, I'm very grateful to be listening and to be hearing from all of the speakers today. So thank you. Um, so moving to our, sort of towards um, what the students would um, want to hear, um, especially when making career decisions, what skills would you say are absolutely necessary for your role in, in this sector? And uh, maybe Diane, we can start with you. 
Um, so for my line of work in terms of social work, mental health, um, adapt to frequent change. You have to be comfortable with going to work every day and kind of knowing overall what you're going to do, but you have to be ready to pivot with whatever is going to come at you. Um, you've got to, again, be comfortable with um, staying productive, even though there's going to be a lot of demands on you. Um, manage patient expectations. So what that means is, you know, people are going to come to you with a lot of expectations. It's understanding um, what your role is, how far you can um, go with the individual, um, a willingness to learn. So in healthcare, uh, once you're in, it's not like you're done school. Um, you are always upgrading. You are always um, going back and learning more um, because the information is always changing. So that's important if you uh, if you are considering healthcare. Um, and in healthcare too, what I find is you know you you can go into it not knowing exactly what you're looking for, right? Because like I mentioned early on, there's so many doors. Once you get in, you'll learn what you like and what you don't, and opportunities will present themselves. So um, the biggest skill I say would be just having an open mind, a willingness to learn, and a good attitude. Wonderful. Yes. Um, we'll, we'll move over uh, and turn the floor over to Inas, if you would also like to let us know what the skills are. So for nursing or nurse, being a nurse practitioner, it's, you have to be able to be able to listen. I think that's the key thing, especially with patients, you have to have listening skills. And yes, that is a skill um, because a patient's not going to last long. They're not going to um, take in the advice that you have if you're not able to listening, listen to them and pick up their key concerns because they may not outright tell you what it is verbally, right? You have to be able to look at their body gestures, their body language, their facial expressions. So if a patient is telling you they're fine and they're also fidgeting with their fingers, that's not, that may not be the whole story. And, and you have, to, it's more than just health and looking at their phys physiology. You have to look, them as a, look at them as a wholesome person, like as a wholesome being and look at their well being and not just specifically their health. Um, you need some type of leadership skills. Um, you need analytical skills. You need to be able to look at lab results and say, okay, this is what's going on. Um, you need to be able to handle stress, like Rose said. And um, you need to be able to be open, again, to be always learning, right? Because treatment for hypertension changes yearly. There's always new... Um, new treatments, new guidelines, you have to be able to be motivated enough to stay on top of those. Right. Right. Um, and then the, just the motivation of it, if you're not motivated to do anything in healthcare, but if you're not motivated to do anything, then you're not going to be able to be successful because you're not able to push yourself to do that. Okay. Right. Yeah. It sounds like what your intentions are before entering into this field are very, very important. Yeah. If you're in it just for the money, that's not going to make you happy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, uh, Dami, would you like to let us know what skills are necessary for your role? Sure. Um, and I think you guys have both touched on that, like everything, listening skills. Um, um, you have to be able to also manage your time, especially with pharmacy, because I mean, I work 12 hour days here, right? Like eight to eight. So then people want to talk to you, but you cannot spend like two hours or something talking to one to a patient because they understand that we are there to help them, but then like managing their expectations that like, okay, I understand that this is what you need right now, but then um, I can get in touch with your doctor or do this and do that versus um, people, if you allow them, they will tell you like their life history, right? But then we don't necessarily, we can't prioritize that for other people that need care, right? 
I'm sorry. That there's a place and a time for such things. And then being flexible. Sorry, Dami. Um, like the internet connection is a little bit. Uh, to kind of go with the coffee. flow. Because things change, and, but like somebody didn't show up this morning. So I'm coming out? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, you are. Okay, that's good. Yeah, so I guess the last thing I would say is being being flexible. Yeah, you have to be able to manage whatever comes your way and be motivated to stay the course. Um, right. Know your why or why you're coming into pharmacy or whatever healthcare field you choose to go into. And don't compare a journey to anybody else's, right? Like um, I think Diane said, like, once you get in, you figure out what you need. Doesn't matter if this person is doing this or doing that. The important thing is you've been happy and then when your cup is full, you're able to show up 100% and serve your patients well. So. Right, it sounds like a key skill is being able to manage your time in order to effectively help as many people as you can while you're, while you're clocked in at work, right? Um, so that's wonderful to hear and uh, great advice. Um, Claire, how about yourself? What is um, what are some absolutely crucial skills that you would say that you need for to for your position? Um, like some others mentioned, adaptability. Like I said, it's a very dynamic workplace, so you're always kind of changing. So um, being okay with change. I mean, it's okay to. I still have anxiety, you know, when things change all of a sudden, but being able to push through that discomfort and, and, and work with it. Um, also knowing that you're working with people who um, I think we've all been touched by drug use indirectly or directly. So in the work, it's very common to have certain interactions that trigger something in you, an emotional response. Um, some personal memories of yours and recognizing whether you're reacting to that, how you're reacting, self-reflecting on that, and really assessing where there's potential prejudices or biases that are coming in and really working through that. You can't, you're, there's going to be biases. You're going to come in with those biases and just being aware of them and working through it is really important. Um, so really pushing past discomfort. Um, discomfort tells you that there's a learning that needs to happen there. So listen to that voice and try to push past it. Um, and yeah, just juggling multiple uh, projects, um, some interpersonal skills, because it's such a social kind of job. Um, and yeah, some analytical skills, because when you do things like program evaluation, just some basic statistical knowledge and data summary is important. And um, yeah, that's what I would say are the key ones. Wonderful. Yeah. Being able to sort of <laughs> distinguish between, you know, personal and professional and, um, also pay attention to your stats courses, kids, those come in, those come into play <laughs> at some point in this, in this sector. Um, I seen, um, Stacy nodding her head a bunch, uh, Stacy, if you could, uh, also maybe if you have something to say about some skills that are necessary for your role. Um, I would definitely say every single thing that all of my fellow panelists said, um, especially the one about, you know, uh, being flexible. And um, I would add to the one that will probably scare some people is uh, those conflict resolution skills, being patient, having that real genuine compassion for people. Um, when people come into healthcare settings, no matter what it is, even for just the screening questions, if they are upset or in pain, um, you are not going to get them at their baseline self. They're going to be really escalated. And so you need to kind of meet them with that calm demeanor, um, that acceptance of like they're really upset, a little bit of insight into, you know, what, what could be going on and what do they need right now in order to kind of like come down. Uh, but then also kind of having that boundary of maybe this is now unsafe and I need to activate my PAL, so my personal alarm system or um, signal for security to join me. But uh, mostly, you know, you have to know how to bring bring someone down when they're really upset. Yeah. Claire, you have something to add to that? Stacey got my brain jogging. Yes, that's hugely important conflict resolution and recognizing when you're uncomfortable with conflicts and avoiding them. Um, Again, you don't see people at their best in this workplace and you can't work in healthcare expecting that. We work with people who are experiencing withdrawal. So they're cranky. They're feeling like they have the flu times a thousand. So being able to be calm and empathetic and also asserting boundaries that, you know, in those interactions is important for both the service user and yourself. Right, 
Right. Um, thank you guys so much for sharing all of those um, those skill sets with us. Um, we we do have a little bit of time left, so just really briefly and really quickly, um, if you could share some advice with someone considering a role in this sector, what piece of advice would that be? Like if you were to look at yourself back before you started in this career or in this sector, what would you tell yourself? Maybe we can start again with um, Inas. Um, some advice I would suggest is try volunteering. So if you have the opportunity now, um, I don't know if schools still do co-op or um, things like that, that those can help. Um, I know sometimes, I don't know during COVID, um, but there used to be programs where you could volunteer at the hospital. And even if you were just pushing patients from day surgery to go to their car, which I did, it kind of, um, it kind of shows you whether you're interested in not just just by viewing the environment. Uh, so volunteering um, is a great thing because sometimes people do go into fields. They spend four years in school and they realize this isn't for me. And not that volunteering will cure, like I want to say cure, um, will fix that, but it might help. Wonderful. Um, as uh, Sarah's pointing out in the chat, you can also see local volunteer opportunities at workforcewindsoressex.com forward slash volunteer. So that's for all the all of you watching uh, interested in volunteering. So thank you for that, Inas. Um, we can go uh, to Stacy. Um, what advice would you give? Um, I think that volunteering was a great idea. Um, definitely reach out to um, uh, if you don't know anyone that's in the role that you're, you know, uh, wondering about, I would go to the school that you're closest to, to say, you know, could I speak to someone in the department? Um, those would be some other kind of ideas to do. Uh, but I'd like just really self-reflect, like, what are you looking for? What's going to make you happy every day? Because it's a long time to retirement. So you want to be in a job that you are enjoying. And it's okay to pick something that you think, I want something that's going to feel rewarding. Um, but know that uh, you're in this work to help others. You're in, a, you're in a service profession. So it's not about looking for that self-gratification either. <clears throat> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, next, we can uh, go to Demi. If you would like to let us know what some advice you would like to give um, to someone considering a, a role in this sector. Yeah. Yes, I'll say volunteer. And then I think Inez mentioned the co-op. So I actually do have... I'm sorry, Dami, your, your connection is still a little... Um... I actually have two, three at the moment right now. So that's that's great. That's a great way to kind of have a test of the field if you like it. So sometimes the connection and networking is not yeah. very good. Sorry. Sorry. Hello. I I think I think we can um, maybe come back to Demi um, in a second, but um, maybe if you turn your camera off. You know. <laughs> and then um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Sorry, this is, these are issues that happen, you know, when we move things virtually. These are sort of to be expected. Um, Demi, do you wanna maybe try turning your camera off and leaving your audio on and so you can, you know, share that piece of advice with the students? Gotcha, this is better? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, yeah, I said co ops, right? And then knowing why you're going into the field. I'm sorry. It's also doing it again. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, Dami, but it's it, still it, doing it's it? Still cutting off. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, maybe oh, no you can just type sorry. Sorry, maybe you could just type that in the chat and the students can read it and maybe I could read it out afterwards. But um, uh, Clara, I'm not sure if we've gotten to you about advice that you'd like to share. Or... Yeah, I'll just reiterate. Um, you can always volunteer with our agency to get an idea of what it's like working in this sector or not for profit in general. Um, we also accept nursing and social work students, uh, student placements. 
You can also book when it's not, we know, crossing your fingers when COVID is over, you can book a tour specifically of our needle syringe program, which I think helps kind of make people realize that it's not a scary place. Um, and yeah, just, um, just, I think like when we post job um, app applications, a lot of people applicant, a lot of people who want to apply don't because they don't think they have the experience that they need. And really we're quite open to interviewing people who don't have much experience in this field because all we're looking for is someone who's eager to learn. So don't let that kind of uh, deter you. Right, put yourself out there. You know, there are opportunities to volunteer, whether that's like through guidance counselors or reaching out directly to these organizations. Um, and lastly, Diane, if you'd like to um, share with us some advice. Yeah, so like all the other panelists, the volunteering is it, it's uh, crucial. Because um, again, it's very important to know what you like to do. It's also important to know what you don't like to do. And volunteering gives you that uh, safe space to explore that. Um, and then the other thing I would throw out there is um, don't be afraid to look for mentors. So people that are in the community already doing the job, um, that have experience, We're, we all want to help other people out, um, not just our patients, but people that are coming up the ranks. Um, so yeah, I've, I have uh, high school students because my kids are in high school that kind of ask me, hey, what do you do? Um, you know, so we're always out here to help. So don't be afraid to ask would be my other thing that I would throw out there. Wonderful. Yeah, and we also have a last note from Stacy who says, don't just get your impression of social work from movies. It's not all, it's not a field of one size fits all. <laughs> right. Um, wonderful, wonderful advice to uh, to sort of part ways uh, with our uh, with our, our audience here today. Um, so I just like, oh, we also have Dami's advice. Co-op placements help give you a feel of what pharmacy is like. It's very different from perception. We do more than counting pills. Uh, she would like to share that she is accepting co-op students. So that is the pharmacy on Dougal, just a reminder for all of our attendees today. You can call the pharmacy or have your teacher get in touch with the pharmacy and she's left the number there. Um, so once again, I'd just like to thank all of our speakers today. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, sharing your experience as you know, in your careers and imparting that uh, information onto uh, the students and, and prospective job seekers. Um, if you want to learn more about um, the healthcare sector, um, we also have um, information about the tourism and hospita uh, hospitality sector manufacturing we have done this week, um, as well as agriculture. You are um, free to, uh, to see that at the workforcewindsoressex.com slash career dash library. Uh, we also have a quick survey for all of you in attendance today. Um, it should pop up as soon as you uh, exit this uh, session. It's only two questions, so please feel free to respond to that. Um, again, once again, thank you all so much for, uh, for sharing your time and your words of advice with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.